Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and thank you so much for dropping in. And friends, today I know this is going to be a popular episode. Um, I'm here with my friend Gretel Adams of Sunny Meadow Flower Farm in which in, in Ohio. What city are you in? We're in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus. I knew that it wouldn't come out. Okay. <laughs> so today, Gretel and I are going to be talking about their dahlia tuber sale. Right now, we're in, we're recording this in November. Um, it won't broadcast until a little bit later, but it's like dahlia crazy time mm-hmm. between people digging them, learning how to store them, what to do with them. And so Gretel and Steve do a big they, they grow a lot of dahlias and yeah. they dig a lot of dahlias and they sell a lot of dahlia tubers. And we're here to pick her brain about <laughs> how that all came to be. And just tell us a little about how you go about doing all of it. The organization just start us at the top. Yeah. Well, it's a lot. So this year we had 80,000 dahlias in the ground. So it's a huge wow. part of our production. It's our top seller as far as cut flowers go. And it also, with the tubers is one of our top like products also. So that's like, we kind of have it happening on both, both sides. Um, so for us, it started because we used to grow vegetables and we had a CSA and we had winter money coming in. And when we quit vegetables, we knew that we needed something to help pay for employees through the winter. Um, for the same reason that we do season extension with the greenhouses, it was like the more winter hours that we had for people, the better employee retention that we had yeah. from year to year. And so that's kind of how it started was that we were like, oh, if we have more tubers, then that's what people can do in the winter. And we can also launch them in the winter and and ship them in the spring Um to have that like money coming in to help pay for payroll. So, um, so that's how it started. And, you know, our Dahlia collection, we had, we had bought some in from suppliers, but we also had some that were given to us by a friend who had, you know, family that were Dahlia collectors and stuff like that. So there's some of them that have, have come to us in, in different ways that we've preserved, like through the years, like we have one that's called Connecticut coral. That's like, we don't know what it's actually called, but it came from a farm in Connecticut. And so that's like what, (laughs) even he doesn't know what it's called. You know, it's one of those, um, but maybe we'll never know what it is. But, um, but I think that part of the like search for me is the like fun part of like trying to find ones that we try to have our selection be like the the best for like cut flower production. So there's a ton of dahlia varieties out there. There's a lot of like cactusy ones and, um, you know, big fluffy ones and single ones and stuff that we don't grow because what we want is the one that has the longest face life, the best like stem length. Um, and what's happening now, because the tubers are such a big part of what we're doing, we also want it to be a good tuber producer. So there's a few varieties that are getting cut out at this point, just because it feels like every year we're trying to save them and, um, yeah, they kind of get a few chances and then it's like, well, if we can't like do cuttings and get the inventory up and really try and get them, you know, as a part of like production, then maybe, maybe it's not worth it to have to be like, um, trying to rescue them every year. Um, so, I'm just going to start with the process of let's say they're in the ground and they're blooming because that's sort of like for us is the the start of the tuber process of figuring out what we're going to have for sale, what we're going to dig, all of that. So, um, okay, so the tubers are in in the ground and they're blooming. So for us, are there, they're guaranteed to be true to variety. So the biggest part of that is like tagging roguing them out is what we call it. Like, you know, getting rid of the ones that are in the place where they're not supposed to be and mapping. So we go through, we tag the beginning of each bed. We use like a flagging tape. I buy it from people that do evergreens because they're already, it's like perforated and they've got a bunch of different colors just because they use them for evergreen 
trees. So we mark ones that were tubers or ones that were cuttings with a different color, just because we get more tubers per clump um, from ones that were planted from tubers. So it helps me better estimate what I think we're going to get out of the field. Um, so tagging, roguing, mapping. So the map, I take that map with the estimated number of feet per variety. That's how I get kind of the first estimate of what I think is going to be available um, with the germination rate. And then I have the numbers of the average tubers per clump, like by variety um, from previous years of dividing. So that's something that we keep track of. Um, so that sort of gives us like the initial list of what we think we're going to sell. And then digging right. happens. And then I do a second estimate based on what actually comes out of the field, the number of crates that are dug, the number of tubers that were divided per crate, which is something else that we keep track of when we're dividing. Um, and sort of an estimate of those two numbers gives me an idea of what I think we're going to have minus what we're going to plant the next year minus the safety factor sort of gives us like what is available. Um, the digging process, you know, we'll make a lot of notes while we're digging. If there's a variety that's like not, doesn't come up that well, or, you know, sometimes when you buy them in, you have uh, what we found with the like Dutch tubers is that you get can have crown gall. Um, I think that that's a really huge conversation right now in the Dahlia tuber world is talking about crown gall. Um, we send plant, we send tubers away to the lab every year, um, and still have not had anything test positive, even though it looks like it. So we still like get rid of things in the field just by visual, um, mm, yeah. because the, the, the tests aren't testing positive, even though it looks like it to us, but we still use our judgment when we're in the field. If you're digging and you see it. If it's bad and it's the whole variety, we leave it and like leave the variety in the ground or we'll dig it up and we'll throw them all in the woods. Um, or if it's just a, you know, a tuber here and there, then it gets, it gets tossed out. So we do um, still do that, even though the tests say that they're, say, right. say that they're negative. Oregon State University is the, the top like lab that tests for that bacteria that causes the gall. Um, so we've been working a lot with them just to try to figure it out. Um, but yeah, tuber digging, you know, every year it gets better. The systems get better. It's something Steve and I talk about, like, if there's something that you only do once a year and you only have a certain number of times that you do it within your farming career to like make it better, you know? So it's like right. harvesting you do every day becomes muscle memory. You have a lot of opportunities to make it better, like, you know, oh, well, we cut that too hard yesterday and some of the Celosius stems were floppy. So maybe it wasn't quite ready yet. Or, you know, you have a lot of you have a lot of opportunities for feedback and like making those changes with tubers. It's something you only do once a year. So there's less opportunity to like fix it and, <laughs> and make it better. For sure. Um, for sure. Yeah. And the wood, but it still is our goal every year to make the systems better. So um, we bought a potato digger. That's what we use to dig. And we plant all of our tubers, two rows in one bed. So the potato digger is wide enough to do both rows. So it's the same variety, you know, on each side of the bed. Then we leave a five foot gap if like one bed has different varieties in there. And then once you see that five foot gap, the digger stops and then we know we'll reach the next tags and that starts the next variety. So our team, typically we would um, have the digger pick them up and they would go into a bin and then another team would follow behind them and cut the tops off of them and sort of condense them into crates for them to come back. Um, this year we had instead of having two people ride on the digger, we had four people ride on the digger and they were cutting them and cleaning them as they were coming out of the field, wow. which was amazing. Cause it made it, it went from what, well, I mean, we also had perfect weather this year. Like it was, it was cold for a couple of days, but it wasn't muddy. So for us, like, well, we have clay soil. So if it is muddy when it's tuber digging time, it can oh be 
I call it the doubt the tuber battlefield because you go through with the digger and it creates these trenches and then you're carrying these heavy crates across the rows to the to the driveway so that way the truck can pick them up because nothing can drive like through the field so we got really lucky this year with weather so it turned from what was a two-week process last year into a one-week process this year wow um, we rented a skid steer and we also got some bins that were like, uh, you know, what they would store pumpkins and stuff in so that yes. it didn't have to be all black crates. Um, yeah, so there's there's a couple like Instagram reels on our stories that kind of show the process that we go through. But, you know, when we first started with dahlias, we were planting them with a post hole digger, like <laughs> one at a time. And then digging them by hand. And then from that process, it graduated to, we would dig a trench and drop them in the trench. Um, and then we got like a, an undercutter, basically what they would use if you were growing like beets or carrots that just kind of cut right. underneath the soil. So that was our first kind of like mechanical digger thing was just like, it was just a blade that went through and then we would still go through with shovels and kind of dig them up and do that. Um, so having the potato digger has been a, has been a game changer for sure. I think it's definitely allowed us to increase, uh, the volume that we're doing. Um, so, you know, there are some, some dahlias that we're planting that will sell every bloom. And then there are other varieties that are mostly like for tuber production, or we know we're not going to cut all of that variety. Right. Um, so we try and separate them kind of in the fields in that way. But we also have a big grocery account um, called Heinen's, which is about two and a half hour drive from here up in Cleveland. But when we're in the, in the thick of dahlia season, they can take like 60 cases of dahlias, which is like 600 bunches. So for them, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, the color or like variety or whatever. So that's kind of when the team like gets to go out and sort of pick all the varieties that they don't get to pick like any of the other <laughs> days, awesome. which is fun. Um, but, so you know, we'll always sell all the white that we can cut all the burgundy. Like it's still in the production as much as we plant is like still not enough. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, that was exhausting. All yeah. that. <laughs> Sorry. It's a lot. And, We're in the thick of it right now. Oh so. my gosh. So I can't <laughs> yeah. imagine the back end of the organization of inventory prediction, which you've already told us about, mm -hmm. but then you're, you, you do your sale and then mm -hmm. the process of shipping dahlias all over the United States, that must be amazing too. Yeah. Yeah. So our team, you know, divides all winter and then we do do early shipping for people that are in like Southern climates or if they're growers that are trying to propagate off of them. So we only offer like a limited amount for early just because we need time to divide them all. Um, basically yeah. like we're not ready to ship them all when it's early shipping time. Um, so when we do early shipping, we insulate the boxes and we add a heat pack and so that does add like a cost. So there is an additional like $15 charge if you do early shipping. Um, and then regular shipping is, so that's typically February-ish. Um, we used to promise specific weeks, but what we found is that like, you know, if we're ready, we're ready and we'll send them out earlier. Or sometimes, you know, we need a little bit, another extra week or so to get them out. So we kind of have just divided it into early or regular instead of like promising specific week numbers. Um, and it also depends on climate. Like this spring right. was really cold, like even in, you know, Southern states and Western states and stuff. So yeah. we were watching the weather and sort of had a map of like, these are the states that we can ship today. And then the rest of them, like we need to hold off because once we got to regular shipping, it was still cold and I didn't want to, I didn't want to send them to Maine where they might freeze in the process. Right. Um, so with regular shipping, yeah, I think we had 3000 tuber orders last year. Um, so it definitely takes the whole team. The production barn gets taken over by tubers. Um, 
sometimes it can be a challenge because it still is like when Easter flowers are happening oh and when it's tulip time. And so that's another reason why we don't promise a specific week number is because our goal is to get them out before Easter. So for some people, that's a little early in their planting times. Like, you know, we don't usually plant our dahlias out till end of April ish, but we can store them. You know, if somebody receives them a little early, they can store them before they plant right. them out. But we kind of need that space in the production like barn for it to be tulip time. Cause we do also, we plant 75,000 tulips. So we need space for those to move through and like bouquets to be made and stuff like that. So um, yeah, we kind of have a spring, a spring crunch time, just kind of like what we're experiencing right now. With yeah, I was going to say, that sounds familiar. I think you yeah. <laughs> already expressed that in um, another time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what are your, um, what are the pitfalls and the struggles? I mean, I can hear to, in myself thinking um, you really have to think through all the steps, you mm -hmm. know, of digging them and storing them. And then what you're talking about in spring, I mean, that's our highest demand season of the year for cut flowers, mm -hmm. right? How bad would it be to clog up your system if you don't have the space or the manpower, which mm -hmm. get stuff out in a timely manner, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that the most stressful part of it for us is storage. So because people do buy it in November or, you know, yeah. throughout the winter and then you ship it in the spring. So it kind of is like a high interest loan because it's like if something yeah. happens where you lose a variety, yes. um, you know, it's like even though we're experienced growers, like they're still there are varieties that store better than others. And, you know, we used to store them in the greenhouse and there are a couple spots where we had a wet drip where it dripped into the crates and then they got mushy. You know, there are, there are things that still happen. Um, sure. So what we try to do, like on our website, when they check out, it says, you know, like there are things that happen in storage. Do you choose like a substitute or a refund? you know, if there's something like that does happen, right. um, which is something that we've learned through the years. Cause in the beginning we would reach out and contact all of those people, but then it's like, we don't, when we're packing orders now, it's like, we don't necessarily have time to wait for right. all of those people to respond to us, to figure out what we're going to do. Um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes when you dig them, you don't get as many as you think as much, as good as my numbers can be. It's like also, okay, we finished dividing this one and we needed 200 and we only got 150. Well, if I've sold a hundred of those, then what suffers is the ones that we're going to plant. Right. So like we always plant all, you know, we plant all the seconds, basic, I say ugly tubers need love too. So it's like, <laughs> we, we send it's out true. all the stuff that like looks good and like is acceptable. And then what we plant end up being the like, the ones that a retail customer would be really upset about if they received, but we know that they're still going to sprout and right. I, you know, and so like the ones that are tiny or the ones that are ugly, um, that still, still produce. So, um, we'll go through when we're, when it's time for planting, we sort through and we'll look for eyes in all of the seconds to like increase our production and then we also do cuttings too. So that's something else that we use the seconds for. We'll pot them up, you know, late winter, early spring and start doing propagations from right. them. That's another way that we like build, build the inventory. But dahlia storage is really hard. It's they, they can't be too moist or too dry. So you have to figure out the right environment for them. So they're not going to get so much airflow that they dry out but they're also not going to have so much moisture that they get mushy. So um, this year it frosted early for us about a, it frosted a month earlier than it did last year. So last year we didn't dig tubers until November. Um, this year it frosted, I think October 6th or 7th. So everything was out of the ground by the time we got to November. Um, yeah. So we typically will wait for it to frost, but if it hasn't frosted, by, you know, the beginning, I think we started digging last year, end of October and people were like, it hasn't frosted yet. Why are you digging? It's like, because if we don't, then if we don't have enough time, 
it's going to be cold and wet right. and then, then, then the ground's going to freeze. So like there has to be, you know, they're like potatoes where you want the skin to be hardened off a little bit, but if it's that late in the season, then that's going to happen naturally, even though it hasn't frosted. So I think, you know, it just depends on your zone. There are some people right. who it's not going to kill the dahlias back, but you still need to dig them and divide them at some point. So, um, yeah, so we store them just in crates. We used to put them in the greenhouse this year. We built a cooler for them. Um, then once they get divided, we use like pine shavings. We have a cabinet or a, a company that makes trusses here. Wow. So they have like wood shavings. It's kind of the consistency of like what you'd use for bedding if you had like a rabbit or something. Um, and that is just kind of a sustainable source for us. You know, we went through, we used peat, we've used vermiculite, um, but the sawdust seems to regulate the moisture. Oh, wow. Uh, so we use a perforated bag in the crate and then the sawdust and then the tubers, and then we'll cover with more sawdust but you do have to check them a few times throughout the winter you know it's not just like a do it and leave them until it's planting time there's a lot of yeah a lot of checking in and making sure everything's okay through the winter especially since people have, have already purchased them. them yeah yeah so i'm thinking dahlia tuber sales is far less glamorous than it looks and sounds like yeah you know? i mean it's with everything, right? I mean, I, I mean, I hear the, see the conversations on social media. Oh my gosh, I'm going to sell Dahlia tubers next year. It's like, it's not quite that simple. It's kind of like walking through the field with a basket cutting flowers as people think being a flower <laughs> farmer is, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of Excel spreadsheets that go into our estimates and then yeah, oh. we, we have like an alarm system that we use for our greenhouses that we also put in the tuber cooler. So that way, if something went happened where the heater went out, you know, and all those tubers were in the cooler, like that would be a lot, that would be a big loss or sure. if happened, yeah, the power went out or there was a fire or something, you know, like, it's like, there's a lot of money in that storage. So we don't, yeah, we don't take that lightly because we know that people depend on them to go out in the spring. So sure. So Gretel, tell everybody how they can connect with you, how they, I, you, you all post the best videos on your, your account. So how can people connect? So we're at Sunny Meadows Flower Farm on Instagram. Um, and then we also have a Facebook, the Instagram. Yeah. We try to do some behind the scenes stuff because we want people to see all the work that goes into it. And that it, it isn't just pretty arm loads of flowers all the time. Um, so that, you know, the expectation of, you know, why does something cost this much is like, well, but that's because there's, there's a lot of work that goes into, you know, making, making that happen a lot of hands and a lot of love. So, <laughs> yeah. So friends, Gretel and Steve also um, teach a class or have a school, an online course with us that they um, have created, and it's called Growing Cut Flowers in Hoop and Greenhouses. And it is a six week long course. Um, registration only opens once a year. This year, it's November 19th through the 23rd. This is 2022, and we we're recording this in early November. And I would invite you um, to check out their page that tells you more about it. But Gretel, just tell us kind of what it's six weeks long and the way it works is every week, um, all of a sudden your online library has a lot more additional videos to watch. And then they do a live Q&A each, each week. Tell us what the overview of each week is for your school. Yeah. So week one is just kind of the introductory stuff talking about what sort of greenhouse works for me, location, um, how you make those decisions, just things to think about. Are you going to heat it or not? Um, low tunnel, high tunnel, that kind of stuff. Um, so then week two talks about making sure you have the most profitable crops in there. So enterprise budgets and crop planning, um, which could actually probably be its own class. So it kind of yes. is 
you know, bree breezed over, but I think in the Q and A sessions that we've had previously, like that's part of what you have access to when you buy it now or previous Q and A sessions. So I know that there's some where we've gone into more detail specifically about how to create an enterprise budget or how to like read one. Um, Week three is about spring crops. So that's what everybody loves to learn about ranunculus, anemones, snap, stock. So for us, that means flowers for Easter and Mother's Day. So Mother's Day is our biggest floral holiday we can hit in our season. So we talk about planting weeks, you know, to, in order to hit the holidays. Week four is about summer crops and fall. So it talks about Lizzie's, but also about mums and extending the season. We have flowers typically through Thanksgiving. So for us, you know, what we do to to get those crops to be able to have enough to provide for florists to have some supporting items for those mums. Um, and then week five is about greenhouse management. So it talks a lot about ventilation, row cover, bed prep, all of those kind of things. Um, and then week six is pests and diseases. So Week six is pretty dense with like information. And I think that that's where people tend to get a little bit overwhelmed, but <laughs> the idea is for it to be used as a reference so that you can go back to it if it is something that you that you see that you start to experience. So we talk a lot about scouting, um, you know, to check in, to make sure that you're seeing things to be proactive instead of reactive. But we also talk about each individual like pest that we've seen or disease, and then some of the beneficial insects that we use and um, a little bit about soil steaming too. So it's like, there are some beginner things in here and some advanced, and then you have lifetime access. So you can always go back to use it as a reference. If it's something that you do get overwhelmed and you're just starting and then we also talk about that in that way with the with the greenhouse weeks of like if you were unheated and you're just starting, here's the few weeks I would start with. And then if you are more advanced or have heated space, kind of how many successions we plant and sort of giving all of that information. So you have the ability to sort of take from it what you can or what you need at that point and right. then kind of return to it when you um, are ready for more. And so something that's um, a new addition that's coming on board in their course um, when it goes live in January is that the classes or the sessions are now time stamped. The videos are. So that means that you will have a document that you can look at and go to that disease sessions and you can find out exactly where this X, Y, Z disease is, what the time that it occurs. So you can go right in and go to it. Um, and so that'll be, of course, available to all their previous students um, when it's loaded in and all of their new students. And that will happen in January. So the course goes on sale November um, 19th through the 23rd, the class is $595. You have lifetime unlimited access. And what in the world does that mean? That means as if you have internet and you have a device that you can log into, um, you go right to your library and all the videos are right there as well as the handouts. Um, everything is there. You can watch as many times as you want. And as Gretel has mentioned, I mean, it is so surprising how when you watch it the first time, you take in about a quarter of a tenth. <laughs> I mean, a minute amount of the information. You tend to take in what you're facing today. But mm -hmm. then four months from now or six months from now, all right, you got that under your belt. You go back in and it's like, I didn't even realize they said that, you know, because you're in a new place. And that's where the real use of these courses is proven to be incredibly useful to people is as your business grows and develops, you can revisit constantly to see what they're saying about that. Right. Cause I mean, you only, he can hear so much. Um, and I think that that y'all, your course is so packed with information um, that this is a course that you will use for the rest of your growing career. There's no question about that. Yes. Thank you. Oh, I mean, it's true. It's just so, I mean, especially when you're the one that knows all the stuff, you know, I tend to like, you know, in my area, I just spew stuff all the time and y'all do the very same thing. And when you don't know, it's like, it's flying past you like lightning bolts yeah. and you can only grab so many. And so having unlimited access to the courses means that 
um, you don't have to catch them all because you can come back and get them later. Mm -hmm. And that's a really big part of that. Um, so the, all the links are underneath, um, in the show notes underneath this video. If you're watching, the, if you're listening to this on a podcast, you can also go over on YouTube and actually see us if you'd like to see our faces. Um, but all the show notes will get you where you need to be. Um, our courses only, the big courses only enroll once a year because there's so much interaction with the instructors. They do once a week live Q&As after you've had time to absorb that week's sessions. Um, the courses are like almost 20 hours and growing constantly because you also have access to all the previous Q&As. And I've heard from so many people, Gretel, that's what people spend their winters listening to are the mm -hmm. Q&As. You know, they're, they tend to be, they're, they're a little, although now they're much more organized because they have a PowerPoint, um, but there's just so much good meat in there that it's like a whole nother course. So, um, but y'all's course is awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your Dahlia, a look inside your Dahlia tuber sales and how y'all go about that. And um, I think that you all are such savvy business people realizing that you needed to create income in the winter, not just for you guys, but to maintain your staff. Um, mm -hmm. That's just a small inkling, y'all, of the kind of stuff you're going to learn in this course. They are just such great teachers and have so much experience. So I'm inviting you to check it out and highly recommend it. Um, all right, friends, Gretel, thank you so much for joining me here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And Dahlia Tubers go live November 18th on our website. Oh, that's right. And so, so whenever you're listening to this, <laughs> that is the time of year that you will find those dahlias um, yeah. from Gretel and Steve. Always the Friday before Thanksgiving. So we try and capture that, you know, so that way we can have people here and on staff and available, like if they need assistance. And it actually ends up always being like right around when the class launches too. So it's usually it's awesome. a week for us that yeah, way. Yeah, it's a really busy week. Yeah. All right, friends, until we meet again. Bye, Gretel. Bye. Ciao. So here is what another student has to say about Stephen Gretel's course, Growing Cut Flowers in Hoop and Greenhouses. This is Vanessa, and she says, a fantastic course. Marketed as Growing in Hoops and Greenhouses, but don't let that title throw you off. There is so much information about growing different crops if you're looking for that too. The course is fun, informative, and what you need right now to grow your business. The best money you will ever spend on improving your business is the course from people who have been there, made the mistakes, sharing the good, the bad, and the improved. You can't get more real than this course. Thank you, Vanessa, for those words. Yeah.